What's up, everybody? Chris Fluke here. Chris Fluke Podcast, episode 50. Man, I just recorded 20 minutes of this episode. And then I forgot to put my uh, iPad here, which I record the audio on, airplane mode. And guess what? Totally destroyed it all. Now I got to do it all over again. So here's hoping. Second time is the charm here um, as we get through this podcast now. So this episode, GPP, you down with GPP, that's what we're calling it. Uh, GPP is physical, general physical preparation or preparedness, whatever word you want for that last P. Now, just earlier today, man, had two women in here working out, two moms of high school age kids. One of them's like, you know what, isn't it bad if kids are working out, you know, strength training, this and that? And I was thinking to myself, uh, potentially, right? I mean, it, it's risky for anybody to strength train, right? If you don't have proper supervision, if you don't have a proper program, it could be risky. A kid could get hurt if they're, you know, just in there making, a, they make a terrible mistake and whatever. They drop a plate on their foot, a bar on their chest, uh, whatever. Smack a bar off their forehead like I did a few weeks ago. Things like that could obviously happen, right? There's an inherent risk in all of it. So you need a good supervision with that. And then we started talking about, I was like, this, this woman happened to be a college athlete. And I'm like, hey, Think back to when you were 10 years old. Were you able to jump rope? Were you able to do chin-ups? Were you able to do all of these things? She was like, yeah, of course. I'm like, some kids just aren't able to do that now. And that is what basically kids do that are 10. They're 10, they come in here to work out. You know, we're doing things that were done decades ago that kind of get forgotten about now. You know, we're talking about that presidential, you know, uh, fitness test that they used to give out. And I don't know, I think, man, I don't, don't quote me on this. I think Kennedy had something to do with that, JFK. Uh, R.I.P. He uh, created this, uh, you know, there's this presidential fitness test that he wanted Americans just to become healthier and more fit. So when you're a kid in elementary school, we always had this thing. It was, you know, it was a shuttle run. It was push-ups maybe. It was uh, the V, sit, and reach test, things like that. It was a wide variety of skills that they wanted to see uh, who could do it and who couldn't. And he got this wonderful blue T-shirt. And for me, I stunk at flexibility, so I never got it. Failed it every time, man. I had no, my hammies. It was a V, sit, and reach test, man. I couldn't pass that thing for the life of me. Year in, year out, man. That's what humbled me. A smart kid, a smart uh, Chris, 10-year-old Chris, might have uh, learned a lesson there and practiced his flexibility a little bit, but he was maybe a little too stubborn and just assumed that he would get it the next year and never did. Anyhow, that T-shirt, man, that blue T-shirt was enough motivation for some kids to make changes in their lives and try to get that blue T-shirt that they could wear around the school. Um, That's gone right now, and I don't know why. Gym classes are getting cut. Recess is like 20 minutes. Somebody told me the other day, like, yeah, we get 20 minutes for recess. And I was like, you get more time, you get more snack time than you get recess time. What's up with that? Um, so yeah, that's what I'm saying with this stuff. It's like, think back. Kids should be able to do certain things. If they can't do it, maybe they need to practice that more, right? That was my whole idea with it. Another, the other woman that was here was telling me about the over specialization. A, a friend of theirs, their daughter, did sports over and over and over again club this, club that, school sports here, strength training there, um, all kinds of stuff, right? Now they're, now they're freshmen in high school and they want nothing to do, they want nothing to do with working out. So that experience that they had growing up too much totally wiped out their motivation to be uh, fit and healthy as they kind of worked their way through high school and life. Think about that stuff, man. When you're pushing your kid too much, just think whatever you're doing right now might plant a foundation that you don't want. It might plant the seed for your kid, your child, to never want to, to have such a, a negative thought with working out, this negative association. You know, some, a high school kid asked me, like, why do you always ask if people, if people got a good workout in? And I'm just like, I want people to work hard, and I want, I want them to leave knowing. I want them to leave just with a positive thought, like, hey, did you get a good session in? Did you do something today that you never did before in your life? You know, those are the things I like to ask and get them realizing, like, whoa, that was cool. That was positive. It's not about just grinding and grinding and grinding. It's about trying to get a little bit better, just trying to nudge yourself forward over and over and over again. It's having fun with the process, and it's understanding that this is a lifetime thing. Um, that's what I try to instill with these young kids. And I was, I was reading a book, Easy Strength, a few weeks ago, and they, I had one of those aha moments where I'm just like, oh, yeah, that's right. This thing's starting to make sense now because what they talked about here is this GPP, and it's like, you know, you think about sports, you know. So in my experience, I grew up wrestling, and then I've been, you know, coaching kids, say, for 10 years in different sports. You know, the wrestlers, the gymnasts, um, I'm just say for boys, I'm going to say, I know, I know girls could wrestle, and I know boys could do gymnastics. But for right now, I would have some boys come in that were wrestlers. I would have girls come in that were gymnasts. They're able to do push-ups. They're climbing ropes like it's nothing. They could do chin-ups. They could balance on one leg. They could do forward rolls. You know, they could do all of these things. I'm thinking to myself, 
I think every kid needs a wrestler to do gymnastics. With more experience, I learned that these sports are just physically demanding and they start breaking people down. People start taking it to the extreme. They only, they start focusing on one sport at a young age. Then they, you know, uh, get held back a year off for athletics. Then they're only, fo then they're, you know, being homeschooled for gymnastics. Next thing you know, they're 13 and they have a broken back and they quit and never work out again. Or they're getting surgeries and all this other stuff. And I'm like, well, that's probably not worth it. Like, it was great you were at 10 and you could do nine chin-ups and you're a girl. But now that you're 18 and you're not working out, something's wrong here, right? So those demands, you know, those physical demands were too much. And it's a slippery slope, some of these sports, man. It's like you get in the game sometimes and you, you don't expect to, you expect to go to gymnastics once a week. And next thing you know, you're there four days a week for six hours a day and, and all this other stuff. And it, it is, uh, you know, it's tough. It breaks the body down. Um, now, because of these skills that these young kids had, it was always impressive, right? Being able to climb the rope and to jump rope and to do forward rolls and to do chin-ups and all that. It was great. So the idea was like, I need to figure out a way to take those principles that I learned wrestling, that I learned coaching wrestling, and get um, boy, girl, doesn't matter what sport they play, let's bring some of those principles into their training. So we started doing things like that here in the gym. We run, we jump, we throw, we get on the ground, we crawl around, we do chin-ups, we do chin-up holds, we do push-up planks, we stand on a balance beam and do different exercises. Uh, I mean, the basics, we get a rope out and we start doing some rope waves just to manipulate a rope, um, all this stuff, right? We started implementing that with kids. And at the end of the day, I'm reading Easy Strength and I'm just thinking to myself, what I do, well my whole job is, it's GPP. It's kids, adults, anybody, it's general physical preparation, man. You know, it's, it's getting the body, it's, 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 it's creating that, that skill set, that large skill set that's gonna allow these people to excel later in life when, when or if that time comes that they start to specialize, right? So, you know, if I had to define GPP, this is what we're looking at. We're looking at lots of different qualities developed at a very, at a, at a low to moderate level. You know, that we're not spending a lot of time trying to dominate one specific skill. We're trying to learn a wide variety of skills. We're trying to um, improve, we're trying to expand the bag, the, you know, the bag of tricks, so to speak. We expand that bag, the larger the bag, the more tricks we could fit into that bag. And by tricks, I mean skills, right? It's uh, you know being able to jump rope on one leg. It's being able to do forward rolls. It's being able to do a backwards roll, a cartwheel, rope climb. Those are tricks. Those are all the tricks that we want to fit into our bag of tricks, man. The larger the bag, the more we could fit in, right? Makes sense. GPP is general endurance, general strength, general joint mobility, general coordination, general psychological preparedness. It's getting... It's, it's giving you that positive association with training, right? You're seeing yourself improve, which is incredible feeling, right? And then it's talking about, um, you know, you teach certain tricks of the trade, so to speak, where you got some kid hanging from a pull-up bar. Say there's a young girl in here, and she's nine years old, and she's hanging. She never hung longer than 20 seconds. Next thing you know, I go over there, and I start talking to her about stuff, right? Boom, 36, you look at the watch. She comes down, 36 seconds. She almost doubled her time. What's the lesson there? The lesson, the lesson there is that your, your, your mind is going to stop your body before your body stops itself, if that makes sense, right? You know, David Goggins says most people only live to like 40, most people only, uh, you know, train at 40% of their max, right? People don't know how to push through that certain point. I was talking to another dad this week, uh, one son, you know, let's just say we're deadlifting. He's a strong kid. He's like in seventh or eighth grade. 105 pounds, 115 pounds on a hex bar. The kid could probably do 185 if he had to. He got to five and was like, ooh, I think that's it. Meanwhile, I'm thinking as I'm watching him, I'm like, dude, you could probably do 15 or 20 of those. What's going on? He's like, all right, all right, I'll try it again. And then he, he bangs out 10 or whatever the number was, right? But what happened there is his brain thought, ooh, we got a little bit hard, I'm gonna stop. With this GPP stuff, you could start planting seeds in the kid's head that like, hey, all right, cool, you just did five of those. I think you could do more. It looked like you could get about 15. Like, hey, if I was gonna give you $1,000, would you have gotten 20? What's the answer gonna be? Yes. But what stops them? Their brain. So I'm starting to plant some seeds into these kids' brains. Like, hey, you could do more, you could do more. Let's start nudging you to do a little bit more and, and, and stuff like that. And, and, and do it in a positive way. Not like uh, berating anybody and trying to bring them down. It's trying to lift them up a notch. You know what I'm saying? So that's the general, that's like the mental pre preparation side of things that we could start instilling too with these young kids. Um, and like I said too, once we develop these large bags of tricks here, um, 
you know, once they are developed, it's going to allow us to perform physical work later in life more or less successfully. If you follow the GPP principles, it'll be more successfully. If you decide to skip the GPP and just specialize in your sport, you will be performing work less successfully. Um, that's almost a guarantee, right? So when, we talk about, um, when we're talking about the GPP stuff, right, I'm reminded of a little trip I had. So there's, that, there's like an old Chinese saying, it's something along the lines of, you know, a step in the wrong direction at the beginning of your journey is gonna take you a thousand miles away from your destination. That's not it, I'm, I, I'm just going off the top of my head here. Something along those lines, right? So I think back to this one trip I was on. I was going to Syracuse to meet my boy Robert Wynn, Pearl, AKA Pearl, and uh, we're watching, and a couple other dudes up there, Shrevo and uh, Joey Reese, man. And we were, uh, shout out to those guys. I know they're probably not listening, but if they hear it, I hope they appreciate the shout out. This was about five, six years ago, maybe longer now. Pitt, Syracuse, basketball, Carrier Dome. I've been to the Dome a bunch. I know the route. You're on 80, you get to 81, I believe, and then you're just ripping it. You're on the same stretch for a long period of time. As I'm about to get on the turnpike, uh, something happened. There was cones out, construction, this, that. I end up ducking off on the wrong way, right? So I'm like, crap, I'm going in the wrong direction. I'll just turn around. Well, I couldn't turn around for like 30 some miles. So it added maybe another hour onto my trip. So to make up for that hour, right, what does Chris do? He tries to rush through and he starts speeding. Chris gets pulled over in the state of New York. That police officer, that state trooper, man, he put me in check, let me know, hey, you shouldn't be flying around here like that. It's dangerous. You're putting yourself at risk. How does this equate, man? Because when we start talking about uh, kids, you know, that, that state trooper put me in check. That speeding ticket put me, put me in check, all because I missed an exit, right? But with the kids, man, you know what keeps kids in check? Overuse injuries, right? If they try to rush through something, if they try to rush to get to a destination without taking the time to, to, to follow the plan accordingly, like I did, you know, like I made that mistake driving, I wasn't following the route like I should have, and it cost me, and I tried to rush to catch up. If you try to rush to catch up and you skip out on the foundation stuff, something's gonna put you right back in a check. You're either gonna get hurt, you're gonna get burned out, um, you're gonna have these different nagging injuries, or you're gonna have a general distaste in your mouth from uh, just from exercise. Like the teenage girl that lives locally here, she, she did so much stuff growing up that she's totally turned off by it. And this is not the first time I've heard of this, right? Everybody knows this story. In the Easy Strength book that, that you know, motivated me to do this GPP episode. Pavel Satsulain, the author, he, he talks about how his mother was a ballerina and she was in the ballet from you know six years old to, to the university. And um, eventually she quit and she was so disgusted by her whole life, what she did her whole life, too much specialization that she just doesn't want anything to do with physical exercise anymore. Too much specialization led to her not wanting to work out again. And what happens when you don't work out as you get older, bad things start to happen to the body, man. So we gotta keep a good positive vibe with everything that we do, right? Speaking of easy strength, speaking of Pavel, speaking of Russia, you know, he said when he was growing up, he was thinking back to things and like 80% of young athletes training in Russia when he was growing up was spent in this GPP phase. I look around with the kids that I work with and I'm like, this is my job, man. My job is GPP. Doesn't matter who they are. I'm trying to get their skill set large and then when they get older, they can specialize. When they go to college, they'll have coaches that, that kind of get them in check with what they want. But right now, man, my job is to get these kids, to teach them a broad array of skills, try to get them better at these skills, and eventually over time, uh, we start uh, you know, specializing, getting a little bit more intense, so to speak, with some of these drills. But at this young age, it's all about accumulating skills. There's this formula, the AIT formula. It's a basically accumulate is the A, uh, intensifies the I, T is transform, I believe, right? So with the young kids, you know, prepubescent, we'll say, the, the idea is going to be to accumulate as much skills as possible. The I of that, intensity, once we start hitting puberty and we start being able to get some strength gains, some power gains, some speed gains, then we can start to intensify our training just a notch, right? Each year we can kind of crank it up one more notch and then we set goals. And then when we either accomplish a goal or we don't accomplish a goal, the T in this formula is to transform. The transform is either going to see, we're going to either transform, see the transformation in the way that we play in our sport, or we're going to have to transform our approach so that we can reach our goal, or we're going to have to transform our goal and make it something more reasonable, something more attainable, right? But right now, with this GPP edition here, it's all about accumulation. 
Don't rush to the intensification and the transformation phase. Stay in that accumulation phase, especially in that pu uh, prepubescent years, all right? And I think it's better, what's that saying? It's like Orson Welles, I think, said it. Better late than early, right? You always wanna be that late bloomer. I think, I think the late bloomer is a better place to be than the early bloomer, right? So it's better late than early. You could, you could stay in that accumulation phase as long as you want. Eventually you could intensify, but do it later. Do it later rather than sooner, okay? I think I said that at least 900 different times here that I think we're good to go here. So going back to Pavel, going back to Russia. You know, Russia, man, I seem to be talking a lot about the Soviet Union in every podcast that gets brought up because everything that I read always goes back to somebody from the Soviet Union doing some sort of training method that got a certain amount of result that worked, right? You know, they're usually 15 or 20 years ahead of the curve, somehow, some way. You know, I'm reading the Charlie Francis training book. He's writing this in 1988. He's talking about stuff that the Russians were doing in the 50s and 60s. He was behind the curve in 88, and he had the fastest man in the world, and he wasn't even training him to the best of his ability, right? So we always got to keep learning with that. Um, so anyhow, Pavel, Russia, they were gym classes, man. They looked like a playground. They looked like Muscle Beach in Venice. Not, the, not the, the bodybuilding section, the outside beach part where we got ropes, there's poles there, there's ropes to climb, there's parallel bars, there's uneven bars, balance beams, things of that nature. That is what's there. That's what his gym class, his, his recess looked like in Russia. My goal for this wonderful 10 acre horse farm that we have here is to create that vibe outdoors here where we got the gym inside but we also got our own little playground outdoors where we could practice some of these skills. We're trying to bring back some of those old school style methods to training so these young kids have an opportunity to develop to the best of their ability and have a hell of a time while doing it, right? Gym classes are getting cut, recess is down. Some girl, a 10 year old told me the other day, I'm like, oh, do you guys have recess? She said, yeah, we have it for 20 minutes. I'm like, I threw my papers up in the air and was like, 20 minutes, 20 freaking minutes. Meanwhile, these kids are here for an hour and they could go for two hours. I'm like, no wonder, man, these kids have nowhere to let their steam off. Um, let the kids run around and go explore for, for two hours, man. They'll probably be better students for it. Anyhow, we got an issue there, right? Gym classes are different, recess is different. That's a problem. Um, so what are we supposed to do about it? If our schools aren't offering it, if, if the, the vibe in youth sports and then the club sports system is going more towards specialization, what do we do as a parent? What do we do as a strength coach? What do we do as a sport coach? I'm happy that there's some coaches in this area. You know, fifth and sixth grade girls lacrosse team, they want to come out and work out. It's like we can't work on our skills because the fields are mush around here. We got so much snow that now the snow is melting. We got 60 degree days now, and every field is just like a swamp. What could we do? Come on out here. Let's go play around outside. We're going to run. We're going to throw. We're going to have some fun. We're going to learn something, and we're going to get a little bit stronger and a little bit better in the, in the process. And it'll hopefully have a fun time, right? That's what we need to do as coaches, right? You know, there's all kinds of stuff we could do. Think back to what you did growing up. Climbing ropes, running, jumping, tumbling, rings, balance beams. Whatever you did in gym class as a parent, try to incorporate some of that stuff in your kid's life. And if you can't do that, if you don't have the facility, this is what you need to do here. I got the top 10 exercises for GPP, my opinion. And these are things that I think anybody could do. There's one thing on this list that I would, I would advise going out there and getting, uh, getting help from, from with, with a coach. All right, and I will get to that. I will save that one for the end. But first, man, if you have a child, you have a living room, you have a bedroom, you have any kind of space, have them get in a push-up position, hold it for one or two minutes. If they could do that, thumbs up. Two minutes would be great. Perfect plank, right, two minutes. That means they're strong and their upper body's ready to start doing some great push-ups with good technique. So if your kid can't do push-ups, press pause on the push-ups, start doing push-up position planks, plank them until the sun comes up, I don't really care. Have them do it once, wait, one minute every day. Say the first time they do it is 22 seconds, fine. Take a break, we're gonna do it again. Now they just did it at 20 seconds. Okay, cool, you're at 42 total seconds. Give me 18 more seconds, you're done with your planks for the day. Boom, they could do that on their own. Tell them to do once in the morning, once at night. If you have a motive, don't make them do it, but just ask them, nudge them, right? We're always nudging people to do more, right? So if you wanna train, if your kid is eager to work out, master the push-up position plank. From there, progress to doing great push-ups. 
After that, we're working the chin up. All right? If your son or daughter cannot do a chin up, you take the overhand grip and you hang from the bar. Same concept that we did with the plank. Let's try to work up to two minutes of straight arm hangs. How do you do it? First day, they do 12 seconds. All right, you gotta understand, maybe we'll do, maybe we'll, maybe we'll, uh, we'll do five sets of this, right? So maybe, that, maybe that's it. Let's do five rounds of this. You just did 12 seconds. You do 12 seconds every time, that's 60 seconds, that's a minute. Next time, add 10 seconds onto that. Try to get to a minute 10 in five rounds. Next time, you see where I'm going here. Minute 20 in five sets. Minute 30 in five sets. Try to get to two minutes and five sets. If you do that, try to get to two minutes and four sets, then three sets, all right? You're with me here. If you can hang with an overhand grip from a bar for two minutes, your grip strength is on point, man. And, you, you, and you're able to mentally get to a spot. Try to just do something. Try to just zone out for two minutes. Try to just sit on the ground and meditate for two minutes. See where your mind goes. Now imagine hanging from a bar. You're gonna to wanna to quit at least a dozen times over the course of that two minutes, but if you could overcome that thought, you're gonna be better for it down the road. We got the push-up plank, we have the push-up, we have the chin-up. The next thing I want kids doing is I want them jumping rope. It's gonna teach being light on the feet, hopefully, right? We wanna be able to have a nice good cadence here. We're not doing a double jump, like a double hop in between each one. It's nice and easy on our feet, right? And then from there, we could, we could jump our feet side to side. So every jump, our feet are going side to side. And then we're gonna go up front and back. All right, I'm gonna have, probably have to do a video on this, actually. This just triggered a great thought. Then our feet are together, we're moving front and back. Then we could do 20 jumps on one leg, then 20 jumps on the other leg, all right? And then we could do 20 kind of high knee moves where we go, each one we switch legs, so left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, as we're jumping rope. Lastly, scissor your legs, right? So you got this little scissor here, you just, here's one jump, and you switch your feet, you switch your stance in air. Do 20 of those. If you do 20 of all seven of those, that's 140 jumps in a row. I think you're ready for, for more advanced stuff. 20 normal jumps, 20 side to side, 20 front and back, 20 on one leg, 20 on the other leg, 20 kind of high knee running, 20 scissoring, 140 jumps. You could do that. You are well ahead of the curve. The next thing I wanna talk about, goblet squats. Holding your, you don't even have to hold the weight. This. Imagine you're holding a cup in your hands. Elbows touch and you do a squat, elbows touch you right inside your knees, you stand up. Elbows have to touch or the rep's not gonna count. As a kid here, we should be able to get into a deep squat. If you do this at age 10, 12, 16, 30, 50, you're always able to get into a deep squat. Your joints, your back, your hips, you're, 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 they're gonna be happy with you, especially as you get older, right? Learn this, teach this at a young age, and uh, this will allow these individuals to, to have strong, healthy, mobile joints over time. From there, we can do a kettlebell sumo deadlift, okay? What does that look like? Feet are nice and wide, toes slightly pointed out. We hold a weight in our hands. You sink your hips back, you touch the kettlebell to the ground or to an elevated pad, and then you stand up, okay? That is the exercise, kettlebell sumo deadlift. The next thing I like for GPP is the broad jump, okay? Why do I like the broad jump? It teaches us that hip hinge where we have our arms up, we shoot our arms back, the standing long jump, whatever you wanna call it. As I shoot my arms back, my hips hinge, and then I'm gonna explode forward. This broad jump, that hip hinge, that explosive hip hinge, it's gonna help me you know, perform exercises later in life like kettlebell swings and you know, some of the more uh, advanced uh, barbell exercises, some of those explosive Olympic type lifts. We teach the hip hinge at a young age with the, bear, uh, with the broad jump. Loaded carries, another great one. Hey kid, pick up two weights, walk down and back with good posture. That's the amount of coaching that you need to do, right? You don't need to be a genius to coach some of this stuff. You just need to be smart and reasonable. One great way to do loaded carries is to have the weight on, on one side only, so an offset load. It's called a suitcase carry. You have the weight at your side like you're holding your suitcase. Or, uh, yeah, a suitcase or a briefcase. Good posture. The weight, because it's only in one hand, is going to want to tip you to that side. Your body, you're going to have to fight that and keep good posture. Walk down and back with it at your side. Then you hold the weight at your shoulder height. It's going it's to want to tip you. Fight it. Fight that lateral dip, that lateral flexion. Walk down and back with it at your shoulder. Press it over your head. Walk down and back with it over your head. 
Switch sides, do it again, right? You, you'll get the idea here. That's one way we can do loaded carries. Another way, wheelbarrow, put some stuff in it. We'll push a wheelbarrow around, push a sled around, drag a sled around, drag a heavy bag, drag uh, anything that you have, right? Push a plate on the ground, do whatever. Something that's gonna help develop your work capacity. What is work capacity? It's performing a task over time, all right? So for example, um, a farmer's walk down and back, 50 yards down, 50 yards back, whatever. Let's just say it takes you a minute. You're performing work for one minute. If you're able to build, it's like think of uh, building a base on the track. If you're running uh, 100 meters, you might run some 200, 300, 400 meter runs just to build uh, an endurance, some speed endurance, so to speak. And then as you get closer to competition time, you could whittle it down and start specializing more. With work capacity, we want to broaden our, our ability to do work so that when we do get a little bit more intense and a little bit more crazy, um, we shouldn't have any issues. Um, our body's going to be prepared for that more intense work, right? So let's review. Push-up plank, push-ups, chin-ups, jump rope, goblet squat, kettlebell sumo deadlift, broad jumps, loaded carries, all right? That's eight. There's two more that I put in this category, okay? One of them is barefoot running, okay? Um, and I'm going to get into that. Let me go over the Turkish get-up first, actually. So our ninth exercise is going to be the Turkish get-up. This is the one that you're going to need a coach with, okay? Because um, you could have some fun with this, all right? But look up the Turkish get-up. Kids start on their back, right? If you're a wrestler, you, you, you'll be able to understand this a little bit. One arm is up. You, you kind of roll to the elbow, and then you sit up, put your hand on the ground. Then from there, we do what we would call a hip heist or a hip lift. One hand on the ground. You shoot your hips up to the sky, and then you bring, you pivot, you swivel one knee under your hip, and you get into this half kneeling position. So if my right arm is up, my right knee is up, my left knee's on the ground, and then I stand up. It's kind of like doing a reverse lunge. And then from this position, I'm standing now, my feet are together, I do a reverse lunge, I, di I, I bend laterally, put my hand on the ground, I reverse the hip heist, put my foot, pull my foot through, go to my butt, Go to my elbow, go to my back. You gotta look this up, the Turkish get up, right? One cool thing to do now is you could put a cup of water, you could put a shoe on their fist, and then you could say, hey, see if you could do this while keeping the shoe on their fist. That's gonna teach their arm to be locked in in the right spot, and it's gonna slow them down, and it's gonna start hardwiring some of these movements that are all, that are all involved in the Turkish get up. That slow movement going through the full maneuver here is really gonna hardwire proper and efficient movement here. And it's gonna really loosen up the joints. It's gonna build some trunk and core stability, some trunk and core strength as we perform this task. Great exercise, right? Great tool. Moving on here, the, uh, the barefoot running like I mentioned earlier. Barefoot running, it's, a self, it's, it's basically what it is, is self-limiting exercise, right? And self-limiting exercise, it's part of our GPP. It's self-limiting basically because it means our body's gonna dictate how hard we could work um, based off of what, like just what we're able to accomplish, right? Jumping rope could be self-limiting because I could only do so much. I could only go so hard as my skill allows me to go, all right? Self-limiting exercise demands greater um, engagement and, and it produces a certain physical awareness. So think about this, barefoot running. You're out in the grass, right? Your, the soles of your feet provide sensory information to your body as your soles are hitting the ground. It's providing input to your brain. Did that stride feel good? Did I overstride? Did that hurt? Am I heel striking? Do I have foot pain somewhere? My ankle doesn't like this. That kind of input that you're getting from the ground into your sole of your foot, into your body. Like I said, overstriding, heel striking. They're not even an option when you take your shoes off you automatically self-correct your stride and you get into a more efficient pattern. Uh, we self-regulate, we wanna decrease the discomfort that might be there, and it's gonna build strength in our feet because we don't have shoes on. So our stride's gonna become natural, it's gonna become efficient, it's gonna build strength in our feet. Stronger feet should be a stronger ankle, stronger calf, works its way all the way up the chain. There's so many bone, bones, joints, and ligaments in our feet that if we have an issue in our foot, even if it's a minor issue, I could kind of work through it, but if it shifts your gait just a little bit, there could be a trickle up effect, right? Um, it could probably work its way up the stream here, and you might experience some calf or Achilles discomfort. You might have some knee pain, and it kind of just all stems from your feet. There was a great, um, a great book, Born to Run. I think his name is Christopher McDougall. I know his last name is McDougall. I forget his first name. Anyhow, Born to Run is all about 
is all about this uh, Indian group, the Tara, Tarahumara Indians, I believe, down in Mexico. Some cave dwelling crazy guys that run hundreds of miles. And these guys use very, these guys and gals use very thin rubber soles. And um, what that does is it gives them almost same, the same feedback as if uh, you were running barefoot. They can't overstride, they can't heel strike. See, the thing about American shoes, I experienced this when I wear these shoes that I bought for the winter time. If I go out for a walk in these shoes, they have such a thick sole. I wake up the next day and my ankles, and especially right around the Achilles tendon, it's really sore and tender. And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? It took me a while to figure out it's my shoes. And the, the issue was I was probably just walking inefficiently because I have this thick sole on that if I was striking my heel a bunch or walking in a weird way, I wasn't getting that feedback because that thick sole was blunting that information. You take your shoes off, or you wear some thin, like, uh, Merrill, uh, real thin, minimus type shoes, you're not going to walk that same way. It's going to fix your pattern. It's going to fix your gait. Um, we need that feedback from the ground. It's going to help keep us healthy. It's going to make our stride a little bit more efficient, and it's going to strengthen some muscles in our feet, ankles, and, and, and all of that stuff's important because, you know, like I said, man, it, it's from the ground up. A lot of our musculoskeletal issues start from the ground and work their way up. Right? They work up the chain. Everything is, connect everything is connected. Just because you're experiencing some knee pain doesn't mean you, know, you, you don't want to just start icing your knee and think that's going to be the cause. You know, I used this example earlier. You have a smoke alarm. It's going off. Taking the batteries out doesn't fix the problem. Well, it fixes the smoke alarm sound. It fixes the sound problem, but it doesn't fix the fact that you have a fire going on somewhere. And it could be upstairs and it, or it could be downstairs. But there's some problem there, and your knee pain is expressing itself when really it's either up the, up, the, up the stream or down the stream. That's where the pain site, that's what's probably causing that pain in the knee, right? So we need to build a big, strong, like we're building a big, strong foundation with our GPP exercises. We need to build a strong foundation in our body, and it starts at the ground up, which is our feet. All right. Also, one cool thing, man, if you really want to double down with the self-limiting exercise, this is what you need to do, right? I'm not telling you to run distance, right? I'm not telling you to get those weird toe sneakers and go run six miles. I'm telling you maybe to get some grass, go to a football field, jog, jog the sideline, jog the whole field, 100, 120 yards, whatever it is, roughly 100 meters. Walk across, jog back, okay? You don't have shoes on, you can only go so fast. You could use that feedback you're getting from the ground to adjust your gait and to run more efficiently. You continue to do that. You do maybe eight of those. So eight 100 yard or 100 meter runs. That should be good. If you wanna double down and go double self-limiting, only breathe through your nose. That'll slow you down even more. I went for a walk only breathing through my nose and I got to these hills right up the road here, Pine Manor, and I had to start breathing through my mouth because I was gasping. And I was like, holy crap, I need to work on this. So that's the next thing I'm gonna be working on, nose only breathing. If you're out jogging on the, on the football field, you don't want to put in a ton of miles because your body's just not going to take it. You need to build up, you need to build up some strength and endurance with this stuff too, guys. So you jog the sideline, breathe only through your nose. It's going to really restrict how fast. It's like a regulator on a car. It's really going to restrict how fast you could go. Walk across, jog back, breathing only through your nose. So now you're doing a double self-limiting exercise. No shoes, no mouth breathing, just your nose, just your bare foot. Get after that a little bit. I think that's a great tool. So you got a kid that's heavy footed. You know, heavy footed kid, take the shoes off, try to fix their stride, jogging in the grass, things like that. We're building some strength in the feet. Hopefully it looks less jarring and less painful the next time they get out there and start running, all right? So in addition now, you know, a little bonus here, and I talked about it earlier. We got those 10 GPP exercises. I'm gonna go over them again. Push up position plank, then the push up, then the chin up, then the jump rope, all right? We have barefoot running, we have goblet squats, we have Turkish get-ups. We have kettlebell sumo deadlifts. We have the standing long jump or broad jump. And we have loaded carries. Those 10 things could build anybody's foundation, okay? Do them if you have a young kid, get them going now. If you have a teenager that's already kind of hit puberty, press pause on that strength training stuff and just check in and make sure that they can do all this stuff. Make sure that they can hold the plank. Make sure they can do an actual push-up. Start putting in some work on that chin-up bar. Like I was saying, hang for 30 seconds with a straight arm. Next step, hang with uh, underhand grip, chin above the bar, squeeze and hold, all right? Next thing you're doing is jumping chin-ups. Next thing you're doing is starting at the top and you're doing eccentrics where you're slowly coming down, all right? Back in the day, the bodybuilders, like my dad would call them negatives, right? The, the lowering part, we're fighting gravity and we're coming down nice and slow. These are ways that we can improve that stuff, all right? So we got the 10 
We got the 10 best exercises for GPP, and we got the tumbling, right? With this tumbling stuff here, just to review that too, man, there's all kinds of stuff we could do. We could do forward rolls. We could do shoulder rolls. If you're a wrestler, the Granby roll. I remember my coach back in the day showed us this video. All it was over and over again, this is a Granby. Some dude hitting a shoulder roll. This is a Granby. Shoulder roll going the other way. These are great skills. Um, you ever see the, like, you, like you'll be, uh, like, but you ever see those movies, SWAT team kicks in the door, cop does a shoulder roll, pops up, fire, and this, that. That's, that's, the, that's the good stuff that our kids should be doing. Shoulder rolls, backwards rolls, leapfrogs. Somebody gets, crouches down, you put your hands on your back and you leapfrog over them, and then you crouch down, and then they leapfrog over you. Some fun stuff for the youngsters. Remember, we're working fundamentals, and what are the first three letters in fun? Fundamentals, sorry, F-U-N, baby, fun. Wheelbarrows, push-up position. Somebody lifts your feet up, you're crawling forward, right? Hand balances, a headstand maybe with your hands on the ground, maybe a handstand, maybe a forearm stand, maybe the dolphin pose in yoga, which looks like a down dog, except you're doing a forearm stand, right? Things like that to prepare the body. Cartwheels, round offs, all this crazy stuff, right? Um, the next step would be, hey, I'm doing a forward roll, cross your legs. Do a forward roll and see if you can stand up on your feet with your legs still crossed. Things like that, right? We could progress these things too, um, which is pretty cool, right? So we got the 10 GPPs, we got tumbling, we got barefoot running, barefoot training, nose only breathing, right? So now we're gonna, we're gonna start wrapping this thing up here, right? So just to, to review some of the stuff we talked about, we went over the exercises enough. Um, uh, just uh, you know, practicing the specific, right? Let's say you're an 11 year old. Let's say you're watching your 11-year-old son get his butt whooped in wrestling all the time, and, and the kids that are beating him are, uh, you know, they're wrestling all year round, right? And you're like, oh, man, what do we do? I guess we're going to have to get him wrestling all year round now. Practicing the specific is going to equal short-term gains, but it's usually going to be followed up with injuries through overuse or unavoidable plateaus. That kid that's 11, that re that's, that's 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, that wrestles all year round, they're going to level off eventually. They don't have the foundation, man. They don't have the bag of tricks that I talked about earlier. They're too narrow focused. They need to expand their bag of tricks. And then they're gonna get bypassed by those athletes, those guys, those natural athletes that could do the tumbling, the jumping rope, the single leg balancing. Those guys are gonna pass them by down the road, all right? Now you could go from a bad athlete to a decent athlete by, by doing the sport all year round, but it doesn't mean it's a smart training approach. You gotta remember that, all right? Um, to go along with that, you know, the, the AAU ball, the clinics, the camps, uh, the speed camps, club teams, all of this stuff, right? My opinion, there should be G, more of a GPP focus instead of speed camps. You know, Pavel says in this book, instead of speed camps, there should be strength camps for the weak kids. You know, there's a lot of kids that don't have the strength. They don't have the, the, the ability to run efficiently, and you can do all the speed camp you want, all the jump training, all the plyometrics, but if you don't have the strength and the fundamental skills to jump and land efficiently, you know, to run efficiently, you're not really going to improve that much. You might get a little bit better, but it's, uh, it's that short-term, it's that short-sighted approach of just practicing the skill over and over again to get better when really we should try to broaden our skill set, okay? Um, and then lastly, I mean, it's what we talked about. It's that AIT formula. We want to accumulate lots of skills. We want to constantly explore new sports, new exercises, new lifts new moves. If you're on the wrestling mat, learn some crazy moves, play around a little bit. I learned that from some great coaches, a guy by the name of Dave Stauffer. Shout out to Dave if he's listening. Always playing around, always encourage the kids to play around. We were coaching middle school wrestling. We had a really good team. A lot of our practice was playing. Hey, get into this position. I'll say go, play around, try some different stuff, explore some different things. You know, I think we had a local wrestler here, won a division one national championship. He said he was playing around and one practice did something. Next thing you know, he hit it in the finals to win his match. He's a national champ, all because of playing around in practice, trying to explore some new ideas and new things, right? We want to explore as an adult, as a kid, as anybody. Keep exploring, trying to explore, try to expand your brain, try to expand your skill set. And I think one of the most important things to say, you know, success doesn't happen overnight. We don't want to be that 11-year-old champion. Excellence demands time. We want to excel in high school. We want to be able to continue to grow in high school. We want to continue to grow in college. College coaches want kids that are going to grow, going to uh, explore and improve when they're there. Not that kid that hit his plateau as a 19-year-old, all right? We got to lay the foundation correctly. We got to build strong habits in body and in mind. Stay positive. 
have fun, try to keep these kids, these kids gotta stay hungry, even when COVID-19 is trying to, you know, lock us all up and lock us all indoors. Kids don't wanna do stuff anymore. We have to do our job as coaches or parents to, to make sure and instill a little bit of a, a motivation to move and a little bit of hunger to, to, to learn and to excel in life. And that is it, the GPP. Shout out to Naughty by Nature. You down with OPP, man. My new theme song is You're Down with GPP. Hope you guys like this one. Have a great day. Peace, everybody.